Local broadcast of Painting with Petard is made possible by our members in partnership with the Prescott House Nursing Home, located in North Andover, Massachusetts, and owned and operated by the Solomon family. And with the Magic Touch Art Studio in Maynard, Massachusetts, owned and operated by Chuck O'Neill. Tonight at 8, watch The World at War, one of the most important chronicles of conflict ever seen on television. Sir Lawrence Olivier, your host. Then at 9, John Le Carre's Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, where friends are enemies and truth and justice carry the ultimate price. And at 10, Hollywood Legends celebrates the lives of two beloved Hollywood stars, Steve McQueen and Natalie Wood. TV worth watching on a Saturday night, so stay tuned. Here at WGBH, our goal is to make every family a member of our family. But we're still one family short, and guess who's missing? That's right, you. Only you can help guarantee that WGBH will continue to bring your family the very best that television has to offer. So please join our family today. Rush your check to WGBH, Boston 02134, or call 492-1111. And thank you. This is member-supported Channel 2, the best television on television. Local broadcast of Julia Child and Company is made possible by our members in partnership with the Victor Company Realtors, serving the residential real estate market in the Merrimack Valley with offices in Andover, Boxford, Haverhill, Methuen, and Topsfield. With the Johnny Cane Company, makers of all-natural Cane's mayonnaise. And with Welch's, makers of fine products from fruit since 1869, like Welch's squeezables, jellies, jams, and preserves. From Welch's, America's Fruit Basket. Funding for this program is provided by this station and by other public television stations. for dinner tonight, and they're very, very conservative people, both politically and gastronomically. What they like is meat and potatoes. So that's what they're going to get, except for the potatoes. And what I'm going to give them tonight is consommé brunoise with melba toast, prime roast ribs of beef, molded tambal of fresh corn surrounded by Brussels sprouts sautéed in butter, and a macedoine of fruits in champagne, and this will be followed by coffee and bourbon salt chocolate truffles. And I think that sounds like a pretty good menu. I'm doing the Melba toast now. But also I think of when you're thinking of a menu, you want to be sure and go over it with your imaginary tongue, every dish, because you want to be sure that you don't repeat anything. For instance, I thought it would be nice to have a souffle for dinner. And then I thought, gosh, I can't have a souffle because I want to have my fresh corn tambal, and that would be two sets of eggs, and you, that's just not done. You can't have cream in one course and cream in another, or eggs in one and eggs in another. So be very careful not to repeat. Now, I've taken the crust off this loaf of bread, and I'm slicing it very, 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 very thinly. And the most difficult thing about Melba toast is trying to find unsliced bread. This is quite good, it would have been better if I've made my own pan de mie sandwich bread, because it's a little more close grain. But anyway, I slice it very thin and put it on a baking sheet and put it in a 275 degree oven and look at it in about 15 or 20 minutes. It's become nice and lightly brown like that. And you can make it ahead and put it in the, in the freezer if you want, but it's so much better than anything store-bought and I didn't want anything rich like cheese straws or a lot of butter, buttery things. So that you can get it done way ahead of time. And also, I'm gonna have to do, I can do the get the Brussels sprouts done way ahead of time. 
And with this, for instance, I could do the trimming ahead. And here, be sure when you buy them that they're good and fresh and thoroughly green and the heads are hard. And then take your little knife and cut the end off and remove any loose leaves, but shave it off very close, because if you get it too, too close, the leaves will undo. And then take your little knife and pierce across in it. I'll do one more. There, that's a hard-headed Brussels sprout, the way it should be. Take the, shave off the stem, take your knife and go pierce it. And the reason you pierce it is just so that you can, so that the water will penetrate more quickly, it'll cook faster and more evenly. And then when you've got them all done, if you want, you can cover them and refrigerate them, or you can do the preliminary cooking, because they always have to be cooked ahead, and then you do something else with them afterwards. And it's a blanching or boiling. I'm not going to do them, I'm just going to tell you how to do it. So you have a big pot of water, great big pot of water, and you have it at a, at a rapid boil, and this should be even be fuller than this, and you plunge your Brussels sprouts in. I have three baskets of them. And then you let them boil with the cover off, uncovered, for, oh, about five minutes or so. And then you t keep testing them. And when they're, they're just done, look at that beautiful bright green. And you put your little knife in. And then you take one and cut it in half and eat it. And it should just be just crunchy and just cooked through. And then they're done. And here I have a whole lot of them here done. And what I like to do is, in this case, because I want them fairly simple, I'm going to cut them in half and then toss them in butter just before, just between courses, just to heat them up. And this you can do ahead, cover and refrigerate, and you're that much ahead of the game. And you know, a lot of people don't like Brussels sprouts. They'll say, oh, it smells up the kitchen. But that's because they've cooked them too long. If you cook them just at this amount of time in that large amount of water, you'll find that they're delicious, I like a new vegetable. Now, I'm in this menu, I'm, I've done the Brussels sprouts and I've done the Melba toast. I'm also going to do the fresh corn tambal and the chocolate truffles and then the beef. So I'm now going to get to the fresh corn and that you can do ahead of time, too. And this is a delicious dish, particularly if you use fresh corn and you have to make it cream-style corn. That is this way, where the corn is grated. And I frankly never did any fresh corn dishes at all because I always thought, gosh, that's such a trouble. If you take a knife, you have to go all down each line like that. And then you take the back of the knife and you get the corn out that way. But this recipe has to have 12 ears of corn, and that's too much work. But there is a little gadget like this. It's like a rake. It has teeth, and then it has a scraper. And with this, you take your corn, and you take the tooth side, and you scrape down. So you can do the whole ear at once. And then you take it this way and scrape. As you can see, the, the nice corn milk is right there in the dish. But, I mean, that's nice, but the best thing of all is to get a really corn grating instrument. And here's this one which has the teeth and the plate that scrapes it in the hole. And just look at how fast that goes. That's a fresh ear of corn. And there's the teeth going up the teeth and through the scraper. Now that's really wonderful. And you can do 12 ears of corn in no time at all. The thing that takes the long time is getting the corn shut. But this really changed my life when I got this, this thing. And of course there are, this is, I like this model because it stands, but here are three other models, all of which that I got in different mail order catalogs. And each one, it's the same idea, teeth and a plate, teeth and a plate and a hole. So, and what I like about this also is that you can do you can do corn any time of year, and this recipe is going to be a very nice one for out-of-season corn. So I've got what I want. I'm going to cook this in a three, oh, in a two-quart mold. And what I want is 
about three cups of cream style corn. And then I have a big bowl that's going to have six eggs in it. So start out with your eggs, which go very fast. Done two by two, and this you can do in the morning and get it all ready for baking. This is going to be, I'm going to bake it and then unmold it. There are your six eggs, and those get beaten up just a little bit, and then in goes the corn and then some flavoring. In goes the corn. Then I want a bit of grated onion or minced shallot or chives, but the grated onion is easy. I just want about three or four tablespoons of that. And by grating it, it cooks easily. And then, because it's going to be unmolded, it has to have a little strength to it, I'm going to put in two-thirds cup of plain white bread crumbs. And those are fresh crumbs. And that's going to give it a little body. And then, do I have to get that back again? I want some cheese. I'm going to have two-thirds cup of cheese. And this is a mixture of cheddar and Swiss. And two-thirds cup is about one and a half deciliters. Lightly pressed down, and that goes in. As you can see, with out-of-season corn having all this nice flavor to it, you wouldn't know that it was out of season or not. And then, two-thirds cup of heavy cream. And I've tried it without heavy cream, and it's not nearly as good. Of course, if you're on a diet, you can't use it. And then it's going to have a little hot pepper sauce and pepper and salt. And I'm going to put in six, one, two, three, four, five, six squirts of hot pepper sauce and eight grinds of pepper and a taste teaspoon of salt and quite a bit of parsley. That's about about half a cup of parsley, and that just gets all stirred up, and then it goes into a buttered mold. But this, you can do this mixing of it in the, in the morning, and then put it, cook it in the evening. It's gonna take about, takes about an hour and a half to cook, so I would put it in the oven about an hour and a half, about two hours before I'm gonna serve. So there's, a buttered bowl that's a two-quart one. In she goes. And the bowl can be more or less filled. It doesn't make too much difference. And then it goes into a pan of water. And the thing is, this is cooked just like a custard. And it has to cook very slowly so the water is barely simmering. And so that's why you use a pan of water. And then this goes into a 350-degree oven for half an hour, and then you take it out, and this is what it's going to look like. I'm not going to unmold it yet, I'm just going to show it to you. This has been sitting for a little while, so it has sunk down a little bit, but it never shows when it's unmolded, you never know how high it was. There it is, and you'll see it unmolded later. But you, it has to, it rises up and then it sinks down a little bit, and you can keep it warm for a good, oh, for a good half hour or an hour. So there's your, there's your, your corn tambal story. And then I'm also going to make the chocolate truffles, which, now let's see, I have butter and chocolate. This is, this is not, not a diet dish either. And I'm going to show you what they look like first. Oh, I've got that. That's not a good example because it got, warm. They have to be kept in the refrigerator. I'll take all this out. There's a chocolate truffle. And a truffle is a little tuber that's sort of rock-shaped. And they make a very nice homemade candy. And here's the chocolate. This is 8 ounces or 225 grams of semi-sweet baking chocolate melted in a quarter to a third cup of bourbon whiskey. And one ounce of this, or 30 grams, is 
unsweetened chocolate and the rest is just is regular semi-sweet chocolate and then that goes into one stick of butter and gets nicely beaten up with a mixer I have a few other things over here Then, in go two-thirds cup of best quality pulverized ginger snaps. See, that's a very easy mixture. And then, a tablespoon of pure vanilla extract. And if you don't like bourbon, and I suppose some people don't, you could use strong coffee and vanilla. So I mean, you don't have to booze it up if you don't want to, but it makes it awfully nice. That just gets mixed up again. And then that goes into the refrigerator. That's a very easy type kind of thing to do, isn't it? And then, I'm going to put that in the refrigerator. Or I'm going to say I'm putting it in the refrigerator. And you have to wait until it gets quite firm. And then you just roll it up. And this is rather, rather messy, but you can always lick your fingers afterwards. And then you take about a tablespoon bit of it and first you put this is a mixture of powdered unsweetened cocoa with a little bit of sugar and a little bit of powdered coffee and then you take it in your fingers and roll it around we see that's quite rough and then roll it in your cocoa and then put it in your little candy cup I got these little candy cups just in my supermarket they're a little bigger than they could be, but they serve all right. And just really one a piece is enough. This is a dinner for six, by the way. But you can make as many of these chocolate truffles as you want, and then you can put them in the freezer. And then keep them, keep them in the refrigerator all the time, or freeze them until you're ready to go. And now, with the truffles done, I'm ready for the beef. And this roast beef is just terribly expensive. And I think that if you're gonna spend all of that money, which you may not do more than once every five years, if ever, you ought to inform yourself as much about meat as possible. Of course, the ideally, ideally you have a marvelous butcher who, on whom you can rely, but not everyone is as lucky as that. There are all kinds of books, and if you go to the bookstore or the library on how to cut up meat and what to look at and and they're in pictures and so forth but inform yourself as much as you can because you're going to spend a lot of money and you want to make sure that it's very very good and even if you're not going to do it for years i think you ought to know what a roast beef is and how it looks like so i have a whole seven rib roast here and i hope to show you a few things about it now this is just the way the beef comes to the butcher and this and if he's a good butcher, he takes off this big piece of fat, and you'll notice always on the fat, there are the markings of the quality, and this is prime. And that means that's the top best quality you can get, and it's usually, you can only get it at restaurants. But if you have a very good butcher, you can get prime. And the second quality is choice. And if you're going to buy beef at all, I wouldn't bother about it unless you could get either prime or choice. Prime is just that much better. It has, it's fatter and bigger and more marbled and more delicious than choice, but choice is a very, very good grade. So there's the fat off. And then the next thing your butcher does, there are these pieces of meat, which they're called cap meat, not cat, cap, because they cap the top of the roast. And these are really uh, pot roast types, and very often they'll take the two pieces of meat and roll them and tie them and then you can braise them. And then you have your short ribs, which are the prolo prolongation of the ribs. And this one end is thick and is good for braising short ribs, and the other end you have to trim and get some scraps of meat for hamburger. And then you have your backbone called the shine bone, C-H-I-N-E. And that should be taken off. You can still use that for soup meat. Then you have a little another bit of backbone, 
and then you have a, a funny kind of a, of a very tough muscle, which I understand some people like to chew, but that should come off when you're going to do a roast. And then you'll usually find this little piece, which is the end of the, the end of the shoulder blade that just bristles. So that comes off too. So there's an awful lot of meat that comes off of this. So when somebody says to you, roast beef is such and such an amount per pound, that's a meaningless figure unless they give you the amount per pound it is for the whole piece of beef. Because when you buy it, you can be paying an awful lot of money for a lot of fat and a lot of bone. It just depends on how much your butcher has taken off of it. Now this is a seven rib roast. So there you've got your ribs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But not every rib has the same value. And look on this, here's a meat chart here. And you should familiarize yourself with what a meat chart and a carcass looks like. This is the, where the head was, and there's the neck, and there's the shoulder braid and the back. And the ribs are officially numbered from 1 to 13, and you start numbering at the neck end. And this is officially number one rib, two, three, four, five. So there are five ribs in the shoulder or chuck section, which on the whole is a rather tough section because the beef is exercising. And then here is your rib section, starting from rib 6 to 12. And that, that's your glory part in there, that and the loin. But I want you to see the difference between, if you, if you say to somebody, I'd like the first three ribs of a roast, that again is an absolutely meaningless statement. Because what you want are the ribs that are nearest the loin. And I'll show you the difference. Here, that is the rib that's nearest the loin. It has that big eye of meat. And here is the rib nearest the, nearest the chuck. And the eyes all become dispersed, and you've got a big flap of meat there. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to cut this into a five rib roast. So I'm going to get the best ribs. That's rib 12, 11, 10, 9, and 8. So I'm going to cut it right there with my big fright knife. There's a little bit of, a little bit of backbone that should have been taken off. Don't be afraid to do some trimming of these things yourself when you get home. Cut right through. Then I'm going to show you how the, the difference, what you're going to see. Then you can compare these two muscles. There's, the, there's your sixth rib, the one that was near the chuck. And there is where you have your, the eye muscle. So it, it makes very much difference which ribs that you ask for. So be sure, remember, to ask for ribs starting at 12, 12, 11, 9, if you want a three rib roast. So this is now ready to roast. And you want to, you want to have a low roasting pan. There seems to be part of an egg white in that pan. Well, that won't hurt anything. <laughs> have a low pan like that, which is a roasting pan, and then Put it, put a rack in it. And although the rib is a standing rib, according to my friend Jim Beard, you want to have the ro roast high enough up in the pan so that all the heat comes way around the roast. And then, that's the more expensive, the more expensive the roast, the easier it is to do, I find. And with this five rib roast, they usually say count on two ribs count on two persons per rib, so that would serve 10 big eaters, but I find that it'll serve 12 to 14. So that's all you need to do with that, except to, I always take a little butter and butter the two ends. Because it has enough fat to take care of itself otherwise, and I do not, I do not salt it, because I feel that salt makes the juices run. And then I think your only other essential equipment is a good meat thermometer. And the kind that I like is the kind that's called an instant meat thermometer. You can read it very easily. And then it, you stick it in, and then you read what it says. It you registers in about 15 seconds, and then you take it out. It does not roast with the meat. But you can take it and stick it in in various parts of the meat. And then you can tell exactly where, where you are when you're roasting it. 
And I like to roast mine at a steady, a great big piece like this, at a steady 325. There are loads of different methods of roasting, but I like to do it this way. So this will be at, it's going to take, this is about 11 and a half pounds, and it's going to take about two and a half hours to roast. And so three and a half hours before you're ready to serve the meat, put it in the oven, then you're sure that it's cooked. Your oven is preheated to 325, then in goes the roast. And then about every half hour, baste these two ends rapidly so that the oven doesn't cool off. And then uh, about after about an hour and a half, put in some chopped vegetable. I just have a big chopped onion and two chopped carrots and put that in the pan and that gives your juices a little bit of flavor. And then, after two hours are up, begin testing it very carefully and seeing how, how the temperature is. And as soon as the temperature is at about a little over 100, just watch it like a hawk, because after it gets to 100, it can just go up very, very fast. And I like to, uh, to take it out at 120 degrees so it's beautiful and rare. And so now I've really got just about all the dinner ready so I can relax for three and a half hours. Well, here we are three and a half hours later and I've got my roast upside down and I'm taking off the bones. Because the rib bones, because I know, I think probably the boss's husband likes bones. And I know mine does and it makes carving a lot easier if you just take them off. And then you can eat them all nice and meaty. Well, it looks rather funny upside down. And they've just had their soup and their Melba toast, and they're having lively conversation, and they're smelling this delicious roast of beef. Now, there are the look at those rib bones, and here we are with that roast of beef. Doesn't that look wonderful? Now I'm going to cut the, cut the bones into pieces so them that likes them can have a bone. And I like to carve and serve on one of these beautiful maple boards. I'm going to put the, put the bones, I guess I'll put them back here along the side. And then I'm going to carve a few slices of the meat in the kitchen and then bring the whole thing in with the rest of it. Then I have a nice serrated knife here. What I like also about this system is that for those that like rare beef, they can have it just like this, and then you can carve off another piece off the end and put that in the oven and do that for those who like it a little more done. There now. In this roast, of course, the whole thing is rare from one end to the other, but one end is a little rarer than the other, so I cut some slices from each and rush into the dining room. And let me review the dinner for you. We have our Melba toast, and there's the consommé brunoise, very nice, lightly wine-flavored with a little bit of very finely diced vegetables that have been simmered in it, a nice beginning. And then the beautiful fresh corn tambal. And as you notice, there's a little parsley on the top because sometimes it doesn't unmold absolutely smoothly. So that's, you always have to have parsley for those things. And the buttered Brussels sprouts around. And then our beautiful roast beef. That's about as nice a thing as one could have. A little gravy. And then here's a fruit bowl, which is cut up fruits in or out of season. You can put a little bit of canned or frozen ones if necessary, and then end up with a tiny bit of champagne, which peps it up a lot and makes it look pretty. And then we have our chocolate truffles. And this is the chocolate truffles because of the champagne and the dessert you serve afterwards with coffee because they've got bourbon in them. So I think this is a really beautiful dinner for the boss. And if she don't like it, she's never going to darken my door again. So that's all for today. This is Julia Child. Bon appétit. Next on Channel 2, British Columbia's magnificent Burchard Gardens on the Victory Garden. And more good cooking at 5 with Jeff Smith, the frugal gourmet. It's the All-American Cranberry today, just a half hour from now.
local broadcast of The Joy of Painting is made possible by our members in partnership with the Prescott House Nursing Home, located in North Andover, Massachusetts, and owned and operated by the Solomon family.